Since loot is such a core part of index card RPG, I thought it was relevant to talk about the basic equipment, specifically right now the fantasy equipment, and add it into the core rules um, and core stuff for what new players might experience as they pick up and look into ICRPG. As well as I hope to answer some common questions that I've seen over the years talking about this basic loot and some ways that you can build out and build on this basic equipment because there's not a lot of basic equipment in this list but really the possibilities are endless if you really think about it. So I'm just going to go one by one going through the list and I've arrayed them out and we're just going to cross them off as we go and we're just going to talk about each one starting with the adventurers pack up here. Now the adventurers pack is a collection of you know a torch, a bedroll, scrap, jerky and really the first seven or so items are packs which means they're a collection of items. Now What's with these packs is that they have a lot of items in them, but they don't actually have descriptions of what they do. Like, what does a scrap of jerky do? Or what does an apple do? I don't know. That's between you and the GM to decide what does that do specifically, as well as, like, in the moment, maybe you could come up with a reason that pulling out an apple might be helpful. You're out in the woods, you're facing a monster. Okay, I'm going to throw this apple across the way and maybe make some so noise from the other side of the glen and he's going to go distracted that way. Eh, that's a good way of using it and that's kind of the benefit of a pack. The other thing is is a pack would only be one like listing on your inventory. ICRPG has that 10 equipped, 10 carried and a pack would take up just one of those slots even though there's multiple items. If the pack is destroyed, then everything inside of it is gone. Again, up to you as, as a player and a GM to work that out. And then finally, um, when it comes to equipped or carried, that's again, how do you play it? What I like to do when it comes to equipped versus carried is that if it's equipped, it means it's readily accessible, like I can grab it immediately, no questions asked. But if it's something that's carried, it may take a little time, maybe just one turn to get it out. So if I have my adventure pack marked as carried, then anything in that pack, I have to spend maybe a turn or an action to pull it out and then I can use it on my next turn. So that's essentially it. But the adventurer's pack is kind of your go-to, just the collection of items that an adventurer might have and you can work with your GM to specify exactly what is inside it or not. Next up is the miner's pack, which is, you know, a pick, a hammer, a small lantern, fire starting oil, compass, breather, man, heavy duty camp, whatever. Things like that. Again, collection of items. How much fire starting oil do you have? Is it three uses? Is it two? Does a pick hammer do X against rocks, Does but not against wood? Who knows? How long does a small lantern last? What does it do for light? It's just a collection of items and you can get some benefits from maybe be in a dungeon versus out in the forest with like the adventure pack. Work it with your GM. Polar pack focused on cold weather, you know, fur lined pack built with warm sealskin cloak, contains fire pot, fur mittens, snow blind goggles, ski poles, boots and rope. So again, a pack focused on snow equipment. May not be as beneficial in the desert, but maybe you might have some advantages and get some easy rolls in the, you know, the waste and the salt frost of Olo. You've got the fisherman satchel. One of my favorites. I do enjoy that one. Uh, it has mesh, creel, two fishing poles, tackle box, fillet knife, basket snares, swim fins. So again, you get some benefits out in the water. You can maybe catch some fish. You might be able to use that fishing pole creatively to you know, dangle some bait in front of some monster, in front of a cave. Who knows? You got some options with that uh, fisherman's satchel. Mender's toolbox. This is hammers, pliers, leather strips, spare buckles used for anything from armor to boat repair. So it doesn't list specific abilities, but maybe you might be able to repair a shield or if something were damaged, maybe if you kept it in your inventory when you find safety, you could spend some time or effort to repair it and get it back to normal with the Mender's toolbox. So a fun one to have, especially if you're trying to be a kind of a support character. Then you've got the healer's case. Uh, this gives you bandages, tinctures, and serums, and it act this one is the one of the first ones that gives you an actual ability, which is heal 1 HP on an ally with an int or whiz roll, and includes some bottles, scalp scalpel, and anti-venom. Now, that one ability for healing, what I like to do, and what I've seen a lot in the forums and in the community, is that 
if you have the healer's case and you want to come up and heal somebody, especially someone who's dying, you can use your healer's case in place of a don't die on me and roll. And so a don't die on me is an int whiz to stabilize someone who's dying, but then they have to recover on future turns. Healer's case bypasses that roll. If you succeed on that int or whiz, you heal them up to one by one HP. They immediately pop from dying, they skip the stabilization, and they're they're back in the game. So this is a fun one to include for you know popping people back up when they're dying. So it can give you some options there. Plus anti venom or whatever. Who knows if that comes into play? I've seen it happen. I have anti venom. Great. Negate the poison that you just you were just received. You got the climber gear: grapples, hooks, steels, belt, bolt boots, iron spikes. Again. It's great to have rope, it's great to be able to climb, you get some easy climbing, you get some access to rope and whatever, so this is again a great just dungeoneering item, but you have to figure out what you do with it. And now we're actually getting into items with more specific abilities, like the mixed armor garb. Basic common garb for adventurers, you get padded clothes, a little, you know, leather belts, a little bit of armor, odds and ends, it gives you plus two defense. Simple as that. You've got Heavy Plate, which is better than the Mixed Armor because it gives you plus four defense, but your dex is always hard. Now when it says always, you depends on the GM. Do you say, if something were easy, but you have Heavy Plate, does it make it normal instead? And so you're just starting it hard and then you move it down from there up to the GM. It says always, so you could also just say, no matter what, whether it's easy or not, because you have heavy plate armor, it's always hard. That's how I usually like to play it, but again, depends on how, how you want to roll with that one. But this is a good one to kind of buff up your defense from the get-go. Then you've got a common shield, which gives you plus two to your defense. And then there's another ability, if hit, you sacrifice the shield and you get to absorb it. Classic kind of negate an attack. A uh, recent question I got was, does this... Is this automatic? Like, does, do players get to choose? Yes, of course. I like to let it so that you can reserve that shield for a really big attack. You know the damage, and you can play it where they have to use it before they know the damage. But I usually do it where after you, I say you got 30 points of damage from that golem, and they're like, I want to use my shield, and it's just there goes the shield. It's negated. It's gone. For the wooden shield specifically, I do like to just say it is toast. Like it is destroyed. There's no chance for repair, even with the armor um, mender's toolbox but when it comes to the iron shield it gives you plus three defense it only you can't use one hand what does that mean i don't know there's not a lot of items that specifically say you can only use it one-handed or not but it just kind of adds to the tone of the the item and you can play it in however you want but it occupies two space and it doesn't list that it has the same ability, but a lot of people say, well, if a common shield can be destroyed to negate an attack, why can't the iron shield? Could? Technically, you could say that. And we've done it before, and it works just fine. The other benefit is if you do allow that, then you can say that the mender's toolbox can then be repaired if you maintain the pieces of the shield for later. Um, and maybe it can be repaired three times before it's toast, or maybe it's an indefinite number of times. Who knows? It's up to you. And the last one is Traveler's Garb, and this is the last of the first section, then we're going to get into more weapons over here. You've got Traveler's Garb, it gives you just one defense, and it gives you some more inventory items. I like to think of those inventory items as equipped, just to make it a little bit more uh, beefy when it comes to it. You could say it's carried, but I like to say it's equipped personally, but totally up to you. Plus, I like the hood. I just think like having a character with a hood. It's cool. Now we're moving over into the weapons, okay, the, the basic items um, and attack things that you can have with it more item-y rather than defense or, or packs. So the first one is you got your sword and scabbard. It can be any type of blade you want. It doesn't have to be a long sword like this. It could be a rapier. It could be a scimitar. It could be a saber. Whatever you want, you've got a sharpening kit that can uh, fix it if the blade is damaged. What does that mean? I don't know, but everyone needs a sword in my personal opinion. Got battle axe and harness. It's a huge chopping weapon. Can be used against timbers or structures. Maybe it does ultimate against doors. Maybe it does ultimate against logs or, or wooden creatures or trees or sh like columns. Who knows? You can use that war that battle axe, but it's impossible to conceal. 
someone has it, maybe guards are like, you know, let me have all your weapons, and then they try to heal that, uh, conceal that. Doesn't work. You've got the Spearman kit over here. It gives you 10 foot oak shaft with a, you know, you can swap out the blades for things like a hook, spearhead, or glaive, um, and then you can attack targets up to near. This is a good call out because technically a spear allows you to attack at near when most other weapons only allow close. It doesn't ever really specify that, but it really calls it out here. Play it how you will, um, but essentially it's just trying to say the spear you can reach further and be further away. So maybe a little goblin that only has a dagger can't reach you, but you can reach it with a spear. And then what it does to a hook, a spearhead, or a glaive, what that does to your spear or your abilities, up to you and the GM. It's a fun one to play with. All right, the next two are a big common one. It's the cross, the, the bow and quiver versus the crossbow and the bolt kit. A big question, and I'll get to this in a second, is why would you take a bow when you could take a crossbow? And because what it says here with the bow is that it's, you know, short or small, it's, you know, recurve bow, either short for small spaces or long for outdoor use. A quiver uh, is empty on a tack roll of a natural one, and then you could carry a spare quiver if you want. So you get this kind of negative bonus, but then you've got this crossbow that says it's a critical hit on a natural 19 or 20, and you have bolt kits allow for incendiary smoke, uh, flare tips, whatever. So why would you take an item that has a negative when you've got clearly this item that has a positive? Well, for me, it's aesthetics. Bows are cooler than crossbows in my personal opinion. They just are, I'm sorry. Plus, how do you, you know, how do you play out that that quiver is empty on that one? Can they, are they empty forever? Or are they, can they find, you know, re recover their arrows? That's fine. Maybe you don't want even want to play with that rule. You don't have to. Um, and maybe a nat one, the crossbow is just as likely to break. You're out of bolts. You could apply that negative there, or you could say that the crossbow has a D4 round uh, cooldown. So after you fire a bolt, you just roll a D4, and in that many rounds, you can fire it again. You don't have to actively re be reloading it. You can just say it's just got a cooldown. So it depends on how you want to play it out. But really, like the the negative and the positive whatever they don't equate to one another it's play what you want to play with so i would take a bow over a crossbow because i like a bow but if you're feeling it take advantage of the the power of the crossbow and then just work from there you've got the war hammer this is another big one that people have questions about because it's a meant for smashing it does if you do five to ten damage it destroys one point of enemy defense and 10 plus also stuns the target for one round. But the question is, is well, enemies don't use defense, right? They use the target number. So what on earth are you talking about when this Warhammer is dealing one point of defense damage? Well, you can play it a couple different ways and it's been just talked about on the forums. You could potentially say, well, if you hit uh, an enemy, you reduce the target number by one to you know to hit that creature after three hits it becomes easy for everybody or maybe you after three hits or one hit it destroys a piece of their equipment so they lose their sword um, it there's there's a lot of different ways and even though it's listed out destroys one point of defense it just takes a little bit of thinking through to interpret that and find a way that makes sense for you and your table so warhammers are great things to play with um, and just make your own then you've got the great sword, a tremendous two-handed blade, five feet long. The, this weapon occupies three spaces and always inflicts ultimate damage. Now this has come up recently as well. Ultimate, when it says something deals ultimate damage, it's not in addition to, it's replacing weapon. So like a sword does weapon damage, right? This great sword doesn't, even though it's they're both weapons, you've replaced weapon with ultimate and now this great sword deals ultimate instead of weapon, even though it's a weapon. But what happens if you have like a weapon plus three bonus on your you know, character and a ultimate plus one? Well, as a GM, you could allow your player to take the higher bonus because they're technically applicable, but still roll ultimate. So if I have my great sword, I would roll D12. And if I have a plus three weapon bonus, but only a plus one ultimate bonus, I could say D12 plus three, and that's what my great sword does 
and so you whenever it says this thing does ultimate or whatever it's it's replacing the effort with ultimate and then the only time you add a d12 is when you roll it like a critical hit for example or with other abilities like that but that's kind of where that comes from so big hefty torton wants to take a great sword do it it's cool all right last few knife belt you've got the you know eight eight daggers throwing knives one scabbard includes a poison protector sheath what does that mean are they limited to eight can they retrieve them i don't know it's just the rogues love their knife belt so go ahead and take it what does it mean for poison i don't know work that out you got knight weapons kit over here um heavy black belt spike mace chain thing using its shields to graze defense by one on each hit same thing if you're attacking someone with a shield just like the Warhammer, you find a fun way to degrade your enemy as you attack so that you get to take advantage of that kind of defense destruction abilities that's included in the Knight's Weapon Kit. Then we've got the Quarter Staff. It's just a four feet length, also includes um, fist wraps for unarmed fighters. Same thing, it doesn't say that you can't attack it near, but you could probably attack with near with that Quarter Staff. Beat him upside the head, maybe it does non-lethal damage, who knows? Just a fun thing for a druid or a monk to have, to have that quarter staff. Exotic weapons. This is represented by this nunchuck, but it's really come up with your own weapon. Chain whips, nunchucks, you know, segmented staff, swords of rings, whatever. Like, just work with your GM to decide on some exotic weapon that you want to work with. And then what does it do? And then finally, this is probably my favorite go-to item when I pick out a new character. It's maps. It allows you to roll int for a check to check for useful um, a useful map. So maybe you're running around and you're like, oh, maybe I have a map for this. Maybe I might have an idea of where things are. Roll int once per location, and you get a bonus. You might get specific information. You might get an easy roll in the future. Who knows? It's up to the GM to really decide to interpret what that means when you have a useful map for the area. But that's a really fun one to have in your back pocket. Now, we've gone through all of the items listed um, for Alfheim's basic loot, but you're not really limited to just these. Alex um, and Joe in their Ultimate Effort Show discussion talked about creating new characters, and one of it is you don't even need to use this list to list out basic equipment. Just pick four things. He listed a goblin that took a chicken, a poisonous frog, some children's blocks, and some other thing probably like a piece of string or whatever you can totally do that just pick four items that feel basic that your character might have that builds out your idea of who you are and work with your gm to decide what they are and these basic equipments are just that they're basic starters you can work with them you can be inspired by them you can reinterpret them and do whatever you want but Take a look at these equipment lists. They're fun to play with. Try to use them, incorporate them in your character, and then learn how to make your own basic equipment items for future games and future characters.